Thank you, Dave. And thank you very much, Doris. Great summary of, of the history of San Francisco Bay. I want to elaborate on that, but before I do, I want you to pay attention to this quotation by Will Durant back in 1926. Subject to change without notice. Whenever I give a lecture, the first lecture in my classes, or a lecture like this, I always tell the audience to be careful of several things. If you look in that direction, about 150 yards, that's the Hayward Fault. 150 yards from you. It might change without notice. What will you do? Think about it. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be under this table with my earthquake bucket. And there's only room there for me. So choose your partners well. Get under the tables. Look at the stuff that's hanging up here. Think about the motion that Doris just told us about of those faults moving in a northwest direction. That's the way the motion's going to go. This stuff is all going to swing in that way towards the northwest. This thing will be headed that direction on the first pulse and back this way, depending when it, when it uh, takes off from up there. And all these lights may come down, too. So please, think about this. Now, I give lectures in other places, like Sweden and Denmark. I just came back. And I never start my lectures there on such things. I mean, we have more earthquakes in a week here than Sweden has had in the entire history of the country. They had one earthquake bigger than a three, and they killed one person who happened to be in a mine. So you know a little bit about that kind of tragedy here in the Bay Area. So what I want to talk about today is San Francisco Bay through time. And we've heard a great explanation so far of um, what Doris was telling us about. Looks like this thing stopped working. But I'm pushing. Have another one? Yeah. Tricky. OK, so you've heard from Doris. Would he push on this one? Ah, OK, there we go. Great. Thanks, Doris, again. So I want to talk to you about San Francisco Bay and its history through time. And let's just get started with some of the basics that we've heard a little bit about. It's the largest estu estuary on the western coast of the Americas, about 300 plus square miles. Uh, average depth about 18 feet or meters, I mean. It drains much of California, and importantly, more than 7 million people live in this area. And that's going to grow. This is a big future that we have to deal with. And there's a big industrial base. But as Doris pointed out, the bay and delta are very shallow, and they're ephemeral. They haven't been here very long although they've been here multiple times, most of the time they've been dry river valleys. We saw this drainage pattern, and here's some of the data from the drainage to San Francisco Bay and the Delta. 152,000 square kilometers are represented by the green, about 40% of California. The mean annual flow is 600 cubic meters per second. There are peaks usually in the springtime when the rains and snows melt, what that go much higher and much lower during the summertime in the fall. So it's a, a Mediterranean climate with peak precipitation. The sediment flow in tons per year, 2.4.2 uh, million uh, tons per year. Doris mentioned <clears throat> the arrival of humans probably around 13,000 years ago by sea or by land. They came across the Bering Strait, Strait under one scenario. Another scenario, they floated by in their boats. Probably they did both. 
And they came to San Francisco area at a much lower standard of sea level, which we'll see. And by the time the bay began to develop, just encroaching in through the Golden Gate, they were began to harvest the new bay. In the past 3,000 years, they built 486 shell mounds around the bay. Most of those have been destroyed because they were pretty rich in calcium carbonate shells that the natives harvested from the bay, and those were used for road metal and concrete. 250 years ago, Europeans arrived, killed the Native Americans off, and uh, began to uh, get into their own hassles. California, 160 years ago, was won by America from Mexico, and the gold rush began. The gold rush, of course, had big impact on the bay because eventually they were doing hydraulic mining, which increased the sedimentation rate, and they used a lot of mercury, arsenic, and other things in getting that. So bay filling began by human causes about 135, 135 years ago. And then, of course, industrialization and development began as well. And along with that, on a worldwide basis, came industrialized global warming, and we're in the middle of that now. And that will be a big factor in all of this. <clears throat> so here's the Bay Area, again, and it's subject to the following things that I want to talk about. Sea level changes, earthquakes on these faults, devastating fires. These three things alone will change the nature of the Bay in a significant way. I'm going to talk about those three. And to some extent, population increase, because most of these things, many of these things, are dependent on population increases at the worldwide level, the national level, and the local level. <clears throat> and then, of course, pollution and invasion by uh, invasive species from other places are also big problems. So history matters. That's what Doris and I are trying to co communicate here mainly, that you can't understand the significance and the future of San Francisco Bay <clears throat> unless you understand the past. And not just the past, uh, but how humans have changed the nature of the processes that gave rise to that past. So it has impact in conservation biology, ecology, evolutionary biology, of course and also geology. So these are important points to keep in mind. I'd like to give you now a few ideas of what we as humans can control that we have not controlled all the time in the past. Radioactivity, not just explosion of bombs, but waste disposal of radioactive materials. Destruction of habitats going on around us all the time every day, right here in the Bay Area. Chemical pollution, uh, we have a big project on the marshes of uh, Richmond looking at the chemical pollution that was put there by humans. They could have controlled it, but instead they dumped ores onto the marsh, which then leached out the sulfur, made sulfuric acid, turned the marshes orange, <clears throat> and then distributed trace metals across those marshes. I won't talk about that today, but we have a big project going on that. Genetic depletion, by this I mean not just biodiversity decreases, the elimination of species, but the elimination of species, subspecies, and populations. All of that is important, and it's all going on today. I won't talk about that either. Climate change, I will. What we cannot control, at least to some extent, are plate tectonics, which Doris explained to you, Sedimentation, although we can control it somewhat. Global climate change, another asterisk, oh thanks, which um, means that we do have some control over these things, and we'll talk about uh, what we can control there. <clears throat> Glacial melting, which is tied into global climate change. Sea level changes, which are partly uh, tied into climate change, but also there's natural functions there. 
And then there's the natural changes in geology and biology, which we can manipulate to a certain extent, which we'll hear more about. So what's the problem? It's nature and it's us. And I think this image of a jet airplane spewing stuff across the disk of the sun really symbolizes that quite well. So the thing to keep in mind, as Doris said, is things are always changing. Maybe not within our lifetimes, but they change on the Earth here, for example, just in the same way that we have seen the change from Frank Sinatra to Eminem. <laughs> or from Barbara Streisand to Lady Gaga. Those are things we relate to. These other changes take much longer, longer than our lives. Sometimes a landslide will take down somebody's house and they'll say, oh my God, how could that have happened? I've lived in this house for 50 years. Man, mountains are temporary. They're temporary geologic features. If you've got a house like I do on a mountain, you ought to worry about it, it going down <clears throat> sooner or later. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So 23 to... <laughs> Maybe I'll sacrifice one of my own bottles. <laughs> ah, thank you. Excuse me. <clears throat> OK, so things are changing in California all the time at different scales. Here's large-term geologic changes. And you can see how there were big embayments in the coastline of California, which didn't even match the coastline that we have today. And that continued and is continuing today. So that in five more million years, we could predict that the coastline will look quite different than what we have today if we have some other parameters fed into that particular model. The climate is always changing as well. Here's a deep sea based isotopic curve, I'll talk more about that in a moment, that shows the changing climate in high latitudes, in other words, closer to the poles than the equator. And this curve shows the change from about 70 million years ago up to the present. And you can see that it's never been a straight line. It's always changing. The Earth is a dynamic place. It's going to change, it has changed, and you're going to experience some change. And if you don't, you and your grandchildren may very well. So you can see that at sometimes in the geologic past, 50 million years ago, it was quite warm in the high latitude, 15 degrees or so, centigrade that is. At other times it was a bit cooler, maybe about uh, five or even less at the beginning of the Oligocene about 32 million years ago. And then there was this maximum period of warmth and another one up here. And then we begin about 14 million years ago, glaciation of the ice sheets of Antarctica. Prior to that time, in the Oligocene, when things were cooler, we had valley glaciers in Antarctica and a few other places, but not ice sheets. Those really began to develop about 14 million years ago, and they have continued to develop as the climate continues to refrigerate the Earth. So that we live in one of the coolest times ever on the Earth. It's always been a lot warmer, almost always. And that's because we're in a glacial climate for this 14 million year period. The previous glacial period was about 250 million years ago, and then there was some, another one <clears throat> about that further, much further back in time, and we see them even back 2.3 billion years ago. So the Earth has undergone periodic glaciations, and we're in one of those periods <clears throat> now. So how do we know that? People always ask this question. And the answer comes from looking at oxygen isotopes, either in ice cores from Antarctica or of microfossils of any age and other fossils that have calcium carbonate. So what the, the way this system works is that there are 
three different isotopes of oxygen. That means that oxygen has eight protons, eight electrons, or it wouldn't be oxygen. But it also can have either eight, nine, or ten neutrons. So you add these up and you get 16, 17, and 18. That means that there are different masses. Each of these atoms weighs a little bit differently. The mass is different. So we can analyze that on a mass spectrometer, a big black box in my opinion. And what we discover is that each of these isotopes behaves differently. The two main factors that control that behavior are temperature, the warmer the water, the more oxygen 18, and ice. The more ice there is on land, the more oxygen 18 there is in the oceans. And we indicate that by what we call delta, delta O18. We always say O18, although the proper way is 18O. But you have to know what we're going to talk about. So O18. The delta, this means the change in the values for oxygen 18, 18 <clears throat> through time. And we take those values in the last 100 million years from foraminifera mainly found in deep sea cores. And here's a typical foraminifera, although it's a little bit larger here than they normally occur. This is a foraminiferal sculpture park in China near the Institute of Oceanology there. And uh, it's just got a bunch of statues of foraminifera. And here's Globigerina, and that's one of those that those curves that I showed you were built on, the oxygen isotope values. And the reason is that the oxygen, it goes in to make up that calcium carbonate, Ca, Co, that's the oxygen, three. So they dissolve the format foraminiferin, and then they run it through a mass spectrometer, the gas that comes off, CO2 run it through the mass spectrometer, get this delta O18, and do that up and down cores, and then come to the conclusions that you saw before. One of the important conclusions for us from this kind of work is this curve, which is based on chiefly the isotopes uh, for the last 700,000 years of the glacial period that we live in. And you can see that there have been big spikes and, and lows, other spikes here, and some of those are due to nature. There were no humans back here messing around with the atmosphere. There were humans, but not messing around with the atmosphere so much. I mean, one of the characteristic things that di defines humans is building and setting the landscape on fire. When they first arrived here, it seems like the first thing humans did was to burn all the landscape. <clears throat> so this shows the oxygen isotope K curve, the delta O18 values. The higher they get up here, there's more O18 in, that, in the water when you have interglacial periods. And there's less uh, when you have the, the, other, the, uh, the opposite. <clears throat> So, I said that these are natural, and the natural things are astronomical. They have to do with the Earth's position relative to the sun. All of our heat energy comes from the sun. Any perturbation of how much energy is received by the surface of the land is going to change the climate and the temperature regime of the Earth. One of the big factors is the orbit actually changes its shape. The Earth's orbit around the sun changes its shape making it move away from the sun at certain times. That happens on about 111,000 year intervals. Then the tilt of the Earth's axis. Our seasons exist for us because of the tilt of the axis of the Earth, which points it towards the sun in the uh, summertime, and then when we're at a different position on the orbit, away from the sun uh, at another time. And then, and that works at about 42,000 years. And then there's the, what we call the precession of the equinoxes. So this is when summer really occurs in the Earth's orbit. And as you change these other things, you change when summer is occurring as it moves around the orbit. And this precesses. In other words, it goes backwards around the orbit. And that's at 
a level of about <clears throat> 11,000 years. So you take the 100, the 40, and the 11,000, and you combine those curves, and you actually get a curve that looks something like that. So here we have interglacials, when all of these three things are lined up so that solar radiation is more intense on the surface of the Earth. We get warmer periods, those are the interglacials. And then we get colder periods um, when they're all lined up in the opposite way. We can tell that, as I said, from the oxygen isotopes. We know, for example, that these periods created a lot more ice on the continent. We see that because when water evaporates from the surface of the sea, because oxygen-16 is a little bit lighter in mass than 18, it evaporates a little bit faster. And you get more of it incorporated into the ice on the continent and removed from the, sea lip, the, the ocean. As a result, we can measure that. So it not only tells us what, when it was warm and when it was cold, but it also is a gauge of sea level because we're measuring ice volume on the continent with that oxygen isotopic signal if we subtract from it the warm and the cold factors. And that's been done. So here we are today on this end of the graph. And we're, we're at this peak. And it started, as Doris said, 18,000 years ago and rose about almost 400 feet or 120 meters in that period of time. And these are the numbers of times then that there would have been a bay. Not these, probably, but these anyway. So if we take another look at that curve, this time it's reversed. Here's the period in which we live. And I've drawn present sea level right there in that blue line. And I've drawn uh, the line that would give us a bay in red. And you can see that here's a bay at about uh, four, uh, 375 or so. Here's another bay, about 290 or so. Here's a bay, 200. Here's the previous bay before us that Doris talked about at 125,000 years ago. And if you add up the, this percentage of time, it's not very much. The bay has very seldom been a bay. It's mostly been a valley. And it's mostly been a little bit cooler here, too. So no, no San Francisco Bay below the red line, a San Francisco Bay maybe five times in this period of geologic time uh, since this period. So what we want to really concern ourselves with is what's going to happen right there when we talk about the future. Let me just blow up that uh, last 125,000 years ago for you. Same thing, here's present sea level, and here's the, I'm rough on these things, this one's not working either. There we go. Uh, there's, there's when you have a bay, and so here's a, here's a valley with some fluctuations of the ocean offshore, but not inside the Golden Gate. We don't get inside the Golden Gate until about 8,000 years ago or so. Really not a bay until five or 4,000 years ago. But we had a good bay before, and Doris has studied that. My student, Amy Lesson, with Doris, studied it. And um, we, we have a, a good idea of what the life on the seafloor of San Francisco Bay was like 125,000 years ago. And so we can use that to compare to the modern to see how much different the modern is and how human impacts may have changed that. Again, I'm not going to talk about that today. So during these glacial times, as Doris pointed out, there was ice all over the northern hemisphere and certainly all over the lower part of the southern hemisphere as well, and especially Antarctica and Greenland that you can see here. And that's then the more or less standard climatic scenario for the last million or two million years. A little bit cooler where we are, sea level much further out from shore, no bay, and a lot of ice. 
So about 18,000 years ago, as we've seen, sea level was about 120 meters, 396 feet below the present. Uh, Dave Lindbergh and I, a year, some years ago, plotted the course of the, the river coming out of San Francisco, going north of the Farallon Hills. Doris has plotted it going to the south. I don't know who has the right answer. Doris and I will slug it out later. <laughs> but anyway, we, we're in agreement on the rest of this. So this is somewhat similar to what it was. Uh, this is the greatest fall in sea level, but all the other ones are in where Doris showed them in here, and never up in here except at those very high peaks that we've recorded with isotopes. How is this going to change in the future? Well, we hear a lot about global warming, and I want to tell you a little bit about how to define that and what it is. You may know this. I certainly hope so. Anyway, certain gases in the atmosphere trap heat just like in a greenhouse. We don't need to get into the uh, physics of that. But these sorts of things are the ones that trap the, gas, trap the heat. The heat comes in from the sun. It's re-radiated by the Earth, and it's trapped, just like in a greenhouse. Works the same way, more or less. There's a lot of these gases, like CO2 and methane, and even C, uh, carbon monoxide, that are contributed by natural things. Volcanoes contribute a lot of CO2 to the atmosphere. Some other sources for methane, for example, bogs and permafrost, are loaded with methane, and when that thaws out, the methane escapes. Also in sediments around the coastal areas, they get loaded up with methane, which freezes in the sediment, because it's got a low freezing temperature, excuse me, a high freezing temperature, so that at 600 meters, the pressure and the temperature at that depth in the ocean, it's sufficient to cause the methane to freeze into what we call methane clathrate. Those methane clap rates, if you lower sea level, because you lower the pressure when you lower sea level, pressure is released on methane, and it can explosively come out into the atmosphere. We have geologic evidence that shows that happening, and it happens very quickly. Some proponents of methane clap rate expulsion from the seafloor suggest that you can change the climate in a decade with that methane. The reason is that methane is about 21 times better at retaining the heat than CO2. So the more methane in the atmosphere, the worse it is. So the problem then is that you put CO2 and methane in the atmosphere, and nature cannot remove it fast enough. And the reason for that is that methane, uh, CO2 and methane both are, have to be dissolved into the water of the ocean where it becomes sequestered by organisms making seashells, foraminifera, clams, things that David works on, or on land in trees and stuff like that. So nature then can't remove it very fast, and it accumulates in the atmosphere. We now have about two or 300 years worth of CO2 in excess in the atmosphere that we can't get rid of using natural means. So people are working very hard on quotes, carbon sequestration, which by that they mean, how do you get rid of CO2 in the atmosphere? There are many ways to do it, but so far, most of them require more energy, hence more CO2, than you're going to sequester. So the atmosphere and oceans are linked, both um, of them warm when these things occur, but not necessarily very smoothly. Just on the way here today, I heard that the Republicans are saying, because there's a big snowstorm in Washington, D.C., there's no global warming. Look, look at all the snow. We haven't had this much snow in decades. That's one of the little perturbations when something in this system is catching up. It's not a smooth transition. So how many of you Republicans think it is smooth? <laughs> Never mind. The key to this whole thing it's the Earth itself, because the process of plate tectonics and the fact we have oceans is what sequesters naturally CO2, methane, and all the rest of them. On planets like Venus and Mars, they don't have plate tectonics, and they don't have oceans. 
There's no way to get rid of the CO2 on those planets. So Venus has become a huge greenhouse planet. 95% of its atmosphere is CO2. There's no way to get rid of it without an ocean to dissolve it in. And plate tectonics to remove the sediment from the seafloor and put it into the continents or other places. So Venus has an atmosphere that's very dense and it's very hot. When the Russian Venera 1 landed on Venus, it sent back some images for about one minute and then it melted. On Mars, the atmosphere is much less dense than the Earth, but it's still 95% carbon dioxide. Because Mars is such a small little planet than Earth, it can't hold a big atmosphere. A lot of it escapes into space. But nevertheless, it's also a greenhouse planet. And we see this elsewhere, too. Hmm. There we go. Whoops, that went the wrong way. OK. One more time, here's the greenhouse gases. The main one we're concerned with is CO2 because it, and methane because they stay in the atmosphere. Water vapor, of course, rains out, although it's a good greenhouse gas. It, it doesn't get up there permanently. These other ones are minor components. And chlorofluorocarbons, I think we're pretty well gotten rid of. Those are the things that beat up the ozone layer. All of them are greenhouse gases. We don't worry too much about anything but these two. OK, so the carbon cycle is this. There are three segments to it, an atmosphere terrestrial biosphere loop, so that CO2 is taken up by the terrestrial biosphere, plants, even us. A terrestrial biosphere, geosphere, hydrosphere loop, in other words, the stuff in the terrestrial biosphere gets incorporated into the soils and rocks of the continents. And then eventually that gets eroded back into the oceans. And then an atmosphere, geosphere, hydrosphere loop, where it goes directly from the atmosphere into the geosphere, the Earth, and then uh, back into the oceans. This is what we have to work on if we want to sequester carbon. And we can do it, probably. Theoretically, it's possible. Money-wise, it's difficult. OK, let's look then at the history, recent history, of um, CO2. This is Vostok, Antarctica, my favorite continent. And it's an ice core that went back 400,000 years. And they dated the age of bubbles of air. And then they analyzed those bubbles of air for CO2 content. And this is what they got. And this tracks that oxygen isotope curve Almost exactly. So that when we have a peak in CO2, it was warm. Here's the 125,000 year old peak of warmth. CO2 is hot. Why is that? It's because we've thawed all these areas. These are glacial periods. So we've thawed out the biosphere and the terrestrial soils and so forth, and permafrost and bog, and they release CO2 or methane. And We've, we've had a natural level in the atmosphere maximum throughout the past uh, glacials and interglacials of about 290 parts per million of CO2 in our atmosphere. So although Venus and Mars have atmospheres 95% CO2, ours is much less than a percent. Here's then temperature superimposed going the other direction here. The red line, CO2 again, the same ice core data from Vostok, the Russian station in Antarctica. And here you can see the peaks, the interglacial peaks, and the valleys on this chart are glacial periods. Lots of ice on North American continent and Europe. And then we come over here, and you can see that uh, here comes CO2 up as the temperatures warm. And now I want to focus in on these periods closer to the modern so that you can see what's happening. Here's the core data for the last 18,000 years. So this is the last glacial to interglacial warming that we're in right now. And you can see how the temperature comes up and then flattens across the top. This has always been a perplexing thing. How come 
it didn't continue to warm and then go back into a glacier, glacial period. There's one hypothesis that I kind of uh, like, but it is a hypothesis. And this is about when agriculture got going and humans started burning a lot of uh, plant material, releasing CO2 into the atmosphere. So even this long period of interglacial could be human-induced by one hypothesis anyway. Now notice CO2 comes up, and then it comes over here. Here we are about 280, 290, and then it takes off. You can barely see it there, but let me show it to you in a little bit closer view. This is the last 50 years. Here's the temperature varying. Oh, most of that's just noise. Uh, here's the Republicans today <laughs> cheering for the snow. And there goes CO2. In the last 50 years, it's gone from over a little over 300 up to uh, today, it's about 380 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. That's higher than it's ever been in the last few hundred, uh, last few million years, excuse me. And one of the big guys that works on this stuff says that when we get to 410 parts per, thousand, per million in the atmosphere, the game is over. All kinds of catastrophes will happen. And um, he's certainly one of the big experts on this. And we only have then about 20 or 30 more parts per million CO2 to go before we reach his point of no return. He believes that this can be turned around if we just stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere. That's unlikely to happen under either the Republican or Obama scenarios. So here's the greenhouse changes then. Interesting to me is that this slide I used when I taught geology one in 1970. It's still valid today. We knew about this stuff 40, 50 years ago. We knew we could teach about it. And we used to say, well, here's the fluctuations, and this is going to be the expected range of fluctuations, including the carbon dioxide effect. That's the human contribution to the atmosphere of CO2. And it will go like that. And it will continue to shoot off into the atmosphere depending, I don't mean into the atmosphere, I mean up until humans stop contributing CO2 to the atmosphere. If you don't believe it, you don't have any data to substantiate that point of view. There's, it's just overwhelming. That, and not only overwhelming, it's theoretically based. It's not just some imagination of a bunch of scientists sitting around. There's theory behind it. So we knew about this. We said a few things. I told my class, you know, when this happens, sea level's going to rise, and uh, all the poor people at Davis are going to be under underwater. That camp will be gone. Santa Barbara will be gone. Irvine will be gone. Um, UCLA will be beachfront. That sort of fits the image. And above them all, Berkeley will be safe. So here's that peak. Here's the last 125,000-year-old interglacial. Here's the glacial periods. And here we come up. This is the normal natural cycle, the so-called Milankovitch cycles of orbit and all the rest of that that I described before. And here's the carbon-induced super interglacial. This slide is 40 years old, too. Why didn't we get it? We sure would have saved ourselves some hard times, I think. Now, this is the CO2 in the atmosphere plotted against population. It's almost perfect. Here's the rate of climb from 310, and here's the number of billions of people, up to we are now almost 6.8 billion people on Earth. And there's a direct correspondence, whether or not they, it's a, you know, it could be a coincidence, so I'm not saying it's cause and effect. But the more people out there burning fuel and wood, the more CO2 in the atmosphere, so it makes some sense. So here's the greenhouse effects. And 
with increasing CO2, we get increasing warmth. Uh, probably that means we're going to get a lot more flooding, increasing El Nino events off the coast here, increasing temperature ranges, probably between 8 and 12 in the air, sea level rising maybe up to 8 meters. If Greenland goes, it'll be a, a Greenland and the other ice on uh, everywhere but Antarctica would be 8 meters. And there's great worry about, the, I mean, everybody talks about, oh, if the ice melts. It may not melt. It may just slide right off the continent into the oceans in a few weeks, and then it'll rise here in San Francisco in a few weeks, if that happens. And there's great debate about that. But we know that the ash sheets are disintegrating, not just melting. So that, that could happen. Increased hurricane and tornado occurrence and intensity. Redistribution of crops and species, we already see that. Go to the grocery store and buy a seed packet, and those seed packets have had the distribution ranges of the species that they're selling to you adjusted to take into account warming climate. They've already acknowledged it, the purveyors of seeds. Uh, increasing diseases, major changes in the oceans, and their biotas, after all, the biotas are somewhat temperature adjusted. The ocean's currents are driven by sea surface temperature. So it's all a particularly interesting thing. Here's, this is down in Patagonia, and here's San Rafael Glacier, Glacier San Rafael, and it has retreated. Darwin was here in uh, 1835. And he saw these glaciers out in the ocean. They're now way up the valleys. And this is what we see today. It's retreated 80 meters in the last 10 years. 80 meters in 10 years. And this is, I've kind of fudged this image. It's really not retreated that far since I took this picture in November. But that's what it will look like. <laughs> not a bad job of faking it, though. And San Francisco sea level has been rising since 1990. It's one of the longest tide, tidal gauge records on Earth here in San Francisco. And it shows about a seven inch or so, I think it is, uh, increase in sea level. And you can see that there are events, especially El Nino events. These are when the oceans offshore become warm because the currents are reversed. And so let's look at the potential sea level rise that may affect us. Let's start at the bottom. All the other ice on the continents, glaciers and little things on the tops of mountains, if you melted it all, and there's about 180,000 uh, cubic kilometers of that ice, it would be almost half a meter, about uh, one and a half feet or so. Greenland gives you 6.55 meters of sea level rise if you get all the ice off of it. It doesn't have to melt. It can slide off. The Antarctic Peninsula is much like Greenland. In fact, the Antarctic Peninsula is one of the, one of the three fastest warming areas on Earth, and there's glaciers all over the place. I worked there in 1971 through 80, and I saw receding glaciers then. And I would tell my team, look at these glaciers. They're all melting. Sea level is rising. So we ought to see a lot of this volume of ice disappear. West Antarctica, about 8 meters also. But the big one is East Antarctica, 64.8 meters of sea level rise, if you cut all the ice off, for a grand total of about 80 meters of sea level rise. And that's what the Chronicle newspaper article showing the Golden Gate Bridge underwater is based on, if you melt all the ice. It's very unlikely that we're going to get all the ice on East Antarctica out, melted into the oceans. But a lot of the rest of this we could do easily. Or so it would seem. So here's the shorelines for different periods of time. 125,000 years ago is this line. And Doris showed that wonderful movie, Tanya Atwater. And um, so that would have been the last interglacial. But let's go down here to 20,000 years. That's this line out here that Doris showed us. This one doesn't move, so you can actually study it a little bit. So study. Doris, this was a lot of fun. 
Here's 10,000, 8,000 in here, 4,000. See that we really had a good bay at 4,000. And then back to the 125,000. Are we going to go all the way to what we had 125,000 years ago? If we do, the delta in this region will be flooded with seawater. Salinities will rise. Most likely, the levees will collapse. Uh, and the marshes are going to be greatly endangered. I mean, as sea level rises, those marshes are tuned to sea level of about five, five centimeters. So if you raise sea level above an average of five centimeters, those marshes have to respond to that by moving. Where are they going to move? Underneath I-80? They can't do that. We got to do something about the marshes. Of course, we've already disposed of about 90% of the marshes, right? This is what it would look like if we uh, rose sea level. I like this Transamerica building. I first thought it was pretty ugly. So the base of the Transamerica building is at, at 6.1 meters. So if you melt all the ice, uh, except for Antarctica and Greenland, that wouldn't even get the bottom of the thing wet. But if you melt it all, except for all of it on Antarctica, that would bring it up to just over the entrance hall on that building. And if you did all the ice, except for East Antarctica, it would raise it up to about there. And then if all global ice was melted, it would raise it about a, a third of the way, or a little more than that, up. Now, I had my class down there on Columbus Avenue. We're out in the middle of the street on uh, Saturday morning trying to figure out which window do you think is going to be the one where the water will go to. It's a great field trip. We should do that. So when is this going to happen? If it's just based on nature, thousands of years. Based on human effects, hundreds of years. Tens of years if we had sudden releases of clathrate or catastrophic collapse of ice sheets like the one on Greenland or on the Antarctic Peninsula. And those are all possible. So within a certain amount of time, this could be a real disaster. When do I stop? So this is the the bay at 125,000 years ago, or what it might look like if we melt all the ice on Greenland and the rest of the world. Doris showed you that. So what, it, what would this do? I have a friend in my uh, high school class, and I went to the reunion. And he found out, or knew, I was a geologist. And he said, Jerry, you don't believe in that global warming shit, do you? <laughs> and I said, well, Wally, yes, I do. And, um, I think you should pay attention to it, too, because you're in the road construction business. And a few, about a year later, I found a report that discusses road damage with just a meter and a half rise of sea level. And here's the values. So 430 miles of roadways in Alameda County will be affected, destroyed, by a meter and a half rise in sea level. I said, Wally, this is a great opportunity for your capitalistic construction company. What else could you want? But more jobs are going to be jobs all along the coast of Southern California and Northern California. And you got the market wrapped up already. He's pretty rich. And so I sent him the report. He says, I'll take a look at it. I bet he's really looking at it. So the other aspect of CO2 in the oceans is that it raises, um, the, I should say, lowers the pH because it raises the, the uh, carbonic acid content of the ocean. And these are just some diagrams that shows one view of it that uh, it's going to ra raise uh, the acidification, which means to lower the pH from 8.2 or so by a point or so. And here's some values. Uh, Here's the last glacial maximum. Here's 1850. So that these values have been coming down this. And of course, you have to get to 7 before we'd call it an acid. But this is the acidification process. And this puts strain on the organisms that secrete calcium carbonate, like coral reefs. So this is of great concern to those people.
Now, I did want to talk a little bit about fire hazard in the next, I'm going to go fast. Uh, we've had a lot of fires in the East Bay. There's been one, one fire about every 10 or 15 years. And here's a list of, of them, starting in 1923, the Berkeley fire, and going all the way up to the 1991 fire, the Oakland fire, where 25 people died, 3,400 plus homes were destroyed, a huge fire. At the time of that fire, it was the largest ever in the United States and destroyed more, than, um, more property than any other fire. Since then, Southern California has beat us. Here's the 1923 Berkeley fire. In two hours, 584 houses gone. Here's the Joaquin Miller fire. This started in Joaquin Miller Park in, or in uh, Oakland, came over the top of the hill, down through Montclair, and over into Piedmont. Fortunately, there weren't very many people living there now, but now I live there, and I'm really worried. And here's the Oakland fire from space. It started about there spread down here, jumped the freeway there, jumped not just 24 here, but 13, so it jumped from there to there. And this was because of the winds coming in this direction. What is global warming going to do to this situation? It's something to think about. It could be that, that the rate of precipitation will go up probably in the winter and spring, making more vegetation, and then in the summer, and fall, we might get many more fires. Maybe not. I think that this is something to pay attention to. So, uh, you know, this was an unfortunate situation for sure. One of the contributors is the growth of vegetation in our parks in the East Bay. And here's Tilden Park, 1910 and 2003. Same spot this photo was taken from. Tilden, for whatever reason, was pretty much oaks and grassland, and now it's all sorts of stuff. Lots of eucalyptus trees. Every eucalyptus tree is like a 55-gallon drum of gasoline. Here's what living in the hills is all about. Every one of those areas is a house back in the bushes, and they're all goners if this burns. And many of those people are fighting vegetation control and fuel abatement. They just, where were they in 1991? Now I wanted to finish on the great earthquakes and go quickly. Notice there are no great earthquakes in California. These, the 10 greatest earthquakes, number one was Chile, 9.5. The Sumatra was number five, that was a 9.2. An aftershock of that was 8.5, huge, huge. Bigger than the San Francisco quake. Doris talked about the system. Here are a list of earthquakes with their Richter scale over there big earthquakes. We're due for a big one. Here's some examples of what happens. I didn't want to show you things from the Loma Prieta earthquake, so this is from Southern California, and you can see that the freeways got damaged. Here's a guy driving down the freeway. He sees it buckles, hits the brakes, skids, and then flies into the air and picks up his skid again. This guy was actually driving his car when the bridge fell on him, and he died. And here's a lesson to be learned. Here's the Oak Knoll Hospital. This is the stairwell that fell off. This was the administration and cafeteria. That's the one floor there. It's all crushed, of course. And notice this. These are their ambulances. These are the ambulances that are going to go out and save you from the injuries you have in the earthquake. But they are all crushed underneath the carport. So there's little tricks to this business. You saw this Bay Area faults a little bit before. Here's the 139 earthquakes that have happened in the last week. Uh, in very, not much activity, actually. It's a pretty calm week. Uh, just a few things down around San Jose, a bunch up by the geysers. Um, normally, we get a few bigger ones, you know, some up around four. But this is the big problem, the probability that the survey has worked out. They figure that between 2003 and 2032, we'll have an earthquake greater than 6.7, and the probability is 62%. The probabilities vary uh, on different fault segments, 21% for this part of the San Andreas, the Hayward, 27%. It's the most dangerous fault. 
It last went off in 140 years ago. So they consider it quite dangerous. Here's the uh, intensities. This is how the ground shakes for this 1906 earthquake. And I want to show you a couple more. And notice that the ground shaking depends on the rock type. Here's bedrock, and it hardly moves at all. This was, uh, here's, here's uh, the alluvium around Oakland and stuff. And here's Bay Phil. And so here's where the cypress structure, this one collapsed right through there. The, uh, Oakland Airport lost 3,000 feet of runway in that earthquake, Loma Prieta. And part of uh, 80 fell apart, too. So those are the kinds of damages. And it's caused by liquefaction. Here's a liquefaction map of the East Bay. And you know, all the red places are where liquefaction may take place. And if there were a 7.2 earthquake on the San Andreas Fault, ABAG predicts this kind of distribution. And notice that the big shaking places are down close to the bay on those, those soggy sedimentary rocks. Here's if the Hayward Fault went off. Same areas are going to be impacted. So no matter what happens here, whether it's on San Andreas or the Hayward, uh, people living around the edges of the bay in these areas, and especially up in here and over there too, are going to get it. We will have a Haiti, but it will be down there. Here's Berkeley. So here's the fault zone going through here. Uh, the campus is right here. It's all very violent shaking. And then other parts of Berkeley. So here's the Hayward Fault coming through right there. 75,000 people in this stadium, and there goes the fault. Now they're revi revamping the stadium. They're spending $342 million to redo it and stabilize it in an earthquake. And the idea is, uh, last I heard, is they're going to build it on plastic sheets. And then when the earthquake moves, uh, it'll just sit on the plastic, and the land will move underneath of it. Now, it sounds kind of silly to me, too, but actually the engineers came up with that. It must be a special plastic, right? <laughs> so let me finish. Let me finish with the earthquake bucket. You've got to have an earthquake bucket. I'll be done in a few minutes, David. You've got to be prepared. I have this under my desk in my office. And after looking at those people in Haiti, people stuck underneath those buildings that had collapsed for 15 days, they came out. Why? Because they had beer to drink, for one thing. One of them it did anyway. So I've re redone my earthquake bucket. So if you heard me talk about this. <laughs> so I got water, lots of water, in my earthquake bucket. I've got gloves, because I figure that when my building collapses, there's going to be a lot of glass around. And I'm going to be under my desk on my hands. I need to protect my hands if I'm going to be crawling around under my desk. And I have knee pads. They're in my office where I can grab them. I've got some food. I put it in cans instead of things like granola bars, because I eat the granola bars, but these are a little harder to get at. <laughs> and I have my pocket knife so I can open them when I need to. And then I have a flashlight, because it'll get dark, right? And I might want to see what's going on. Oh, I do have a few leftover granola bars. I have my scuba diving knife. You never know when you may have to say, defend yourself from other people who want your granola bars. <laughs> no, actually, I, I, I'm thinking I will use this to pry things off of my back that have fallen down. And of course, I have my rock pick. May have to chip my way out of the building. Duct tape, all-purpose tape. You've got to have that. I don't know what for, but you need it. <laughs> I think I've added this, uh, paper towels. I've added a bottle of wine in case I'm there for a really long time. <laughs> and some anchovies. I like them. <laughs> and there's some aspirin in case I get hit on the head, you know, more granola bars. I've got some Band-Aids, although if I go much more than Band-Aids, I probably won't make it. 
A hand lens. You never can tell when a hand lens will come in useful. <laughs> well, like if you got a piece of glass in your finger, you know, you can see it. This is really a handy thing. I, I wear it all the time. I have a, a uh, radio here. It, it works now here. But whether or not it will work when the earthquake goes off, I don't know. Oh, there's some other things in here, but really an important one is this. <laughs> if you're going to spend seven days or maybe 15 days, this is a pretty good thing to have. And that goes right along with the bucket. <laughs> Thank you.